Great to have you along for the ride. Thanks a lot for stopping by. Really glad to have this young lady on. She's a former U.S. representative from Hawaii, was a Democrat. It's Tulsi Gabbard. Tulsi, how are you? Good to see you. I'm good, Joe. It's great to see you, too. I've got to ask you, um, what's it like to be the queen of the world? And you were. When, when you came out, as a, <laughs> you were a front-running Democrat. You're a military veteran. You're an all-American young lady. And the Democrats said, wow, she's the heir apparent. She's the future. And everybody but everybody agreed with that. Does it get to your head? Do you think to yourself, wow, this is really cool? No. <laughs> <laughs> were, were you skeptical from, from moment one? Yeah, I was skeptical from moment one. Like, why Why are you asking me to do this? Right. Why is, you know, Vogue magazine calling me? This is very strange. I don't I don't know anything about this, uh, this world or, or what's drawing this attention. Uh, but every one of every one of those opportunities that's come my way, I have uh, done my best to take advantage, to use platforms to be able to advance the interests of whether it's my constituents in Hawaii, uh, the people of this country, or a lot of the issues that that I've been dedicating my life to working towards. When when they pat you in the back and say, "Hey, wink, wink, nod, nod," you're our 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 new face of our party and, and of our movement. Do they also say, now we, we, we want you to do this. We want you to say that. We want you to vote this way. Do they start getting your ear on all the decisions that you have to make for your constituents? Uh, no, I think there, there was probably some unspoken expectation, but nothing ever explicit. And I think that's where, uh, you know, as very quickly as I started to do my work in Congress, uh, they realized that I was not going to be someone who would accept those kinds of messages or demands or expectations. Uh, and that I was going to remain the same independent-minded person I've always been. Go to TulsiGabbard.com, of course, former U.S. representative from the great state of Hawaii, Tulsi Gabbard. Thanks for, for taking the time. As you're in that in that office, as you, you make that move to Washington, which is a world away from Hawaii, you know, geographically and, and philosophically, did you notice that it wasn't what you thought it would be immediately? You know, I I'd, I'd, uh, had the opportunity to work in Washington for a couple of years as a legislative aide for one of Hawaii's then U.S. Senators, Daniel Akaka. He was a World War II veteran, right. a lifelong public school teacher, and just a great, great, kind man. Uh, he was the chair of the Veterans Affairs Committee in the Senate. And, and so I worked with him uh, to support him in those efforts uh, between my two Middle East deployments and got a behind-the-scenes look at the machinations of the quote unquote swamp of, of permanent Washington. And uh, so when I went back as a member of the House of Representatives, I feel like I, I went in maybe with a little bit of an advantage from people who'd never worked in and around Washington before. Um, and, and so it was definitely not, I, w- I was coming in with very clear eyes about the different uh, peer pressures and power pressures uh, that, that uh, are real still. It's uh, Tulsi Gabbard. Go to TulsiGabbard.com. Is that where they can find your new podcast? I know you're doing a show now. Uh, can they go there and find out where to, where to go listen? Yes. Go to TulsiGabbard.com. All of the links are there to the podcast. Uh, I've also got a Substack page. You can get the podcast on YouTube or Rumble and anywhere where you prefer to listen to your podcasts. It uh, comes out every Tuesday, and I'm taking on uh, a lot of the issues that I brought up in my statement announcing I'm leaving the Democratic Party and using this podcast as a way to be able to dive deeper into these issues, share my views, perspectives, and experiences that has driven me to hold the positions that I do, and then also bringing on uh, guests who who have their own experience and perspective to share on the topic as well. I want to get into your announcement full-throated in a moment, but but I've got to ask you this, and I hope you take it as the compliment that I mean it. Um, your demeanor and your, your sensibility, the way that you seem to stop and think before you speak, and what you say really has meaning is so different than what I'm used to out of Washington. Now, there are a few there that do the same thing, but they've got a different demeanor and a different sort of tone of voice than you do. Um, were, you, were you fearful at all? And again, you don't seem like a fearful person. Don't get me wrong. But no. were you fearful that you weren't in there yelling and screaming and pulling your hair out and, and lighting people up and finding a camera and a microphone every time you could to say whatever the, the cause of the day was? You seem to be very, very well grounded. Um, did, did, were you fearful that that demeanor would at all? all not work with Washington? No, that's it's funny that you asked that question, and I will take it as a compliment Good. in the way it's intended. Good. Um, it's funny you asked that. It, it, it never actually crossed my mind. Uh, I've, I've always been very comfortable with, with who I am and recognize my own strengths and weaknesses. You know, communication is everything. Being able to communicate clearly what I'm trying to convey is always what I've sought out 
to do and always try to do better. Uh, but I, I, you know, when I sit at home and I watch the people screaming and yelling, their hair is on fire, yeah. pounding the podium, like that doesn't do anything for me. Uh, and so it certainly has never been anything I've tried to change in myself to be more like other people. What I know is that whether you're someone who's screaming and yelling and your hair is on fire or you're someone uh, more closer to my demeanor, as long as you speak from your heart, then you'll be able to connect with people. As long as you are who you are and you're not trying to pretend to be someone that you're not, then you'll, you'll be able to connect with people, which is exactly what, you know, working in public office in the political sphere and frankly, even in, in what you do, Joe, um, that that is where there's opportunity to learn and to grow and to affect change. Well, I think every once in a while we get wound up as human beings. And, yeah, and that's, and I that's, do too, every I, now and then. I don't believe you, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, we'll, we'll find out in your podcast when people check it out on Tuesdays, go to TulsiGabbard.com. But, but what I do find is that when I do get wound up, people are like, whoa, that really hit them a different way because generally yeah. speaking, I want to communicate. I want to entertain. I want to make people laugh or think or, or get involved. And I think that you're the same way. When you decided yeah. to run for president, people actually found out that that was really who you were. And I think you stood out. You were the you were the most Googled person for like weeks after the first yeah. uh, um, debate. Then they started excluding you from the debate because they were afraid of you. But as Kamala Harris is calling Joe Biden her future president and she's the VP, a racist to all of the world, you were saying, wait a second, I want to focus on this. This is what it's important to, to the American people. That's why they looked you up. And again, that yeah. demeanor was you were almost Teflon. And immediately you became a Russian spy or something in the minds of the Democrats because you didn't get in line and say, look, I've got to back Biden or I've got to back Harris. I've got to back, you know, fill in the blank person that they say I should back. Were you blindsided by that? Did you know they would get that nasty? I had a feeling because I had experienced some of it already before. Really? Uh, what, what I didn't, what I didn't fully anticipate, Joe, was how closely they would be colluding with the mainstream media, the big for-profit corporate media, and how very deliberate their attempts would be to, uh, you know, put, put me over in the corner and silence or, or actually, but at a certain point, there was a full-on media blackout where they just didn't cover my campaign. All. It was as though wow. I wasn't even running. They didn't include me in lists of people who were still running for president. And, and that was the thing that caught me off guard. I thought, hey, you know, uh, running for president is a tough thing. The odds of winning are low for anyone, but my running for president would at least give me as, as equal an opportunity as any other person running to present to the American people my platform and why I'm asking to serve them as their president and commander in chief. Uh, that, that fantasy that I had was shot down yeah. literally on the day that I announced my candidacy when um, we knew NBC News was going to do some kind of conflated uh you know fiction fictional story about how i i'm you know liked by the russians which is the line they use for anybody and everybody right. that they don't like right and so instead of running the story on whatever day they said they were going to run it they saw my announcement uh speech was planned for a specific day they bumped it up released this story as i was on the stage announcing my candidacy and so that was the first sign followed by many many others uh of just how Again, the media, people talk about interference in our elections, but they never talk about the most uh, guilty culprits in that interference. And it is the big for-profit corporate media working with big tech social media and the political powers that be, I experienced it from the Democrat Party and the national level, to sequester and limit who voters are exposed to. So exactly you think, right. okay... Every person has the right to cast our vote. That is the way we can affect change in this country. It is critical. It's why I'm campaigning for the next three weeks to get people out to the polls to vote for some great leaders and great Americans. But what are voters supposed to do when the political party power elite are working with big tech and corporate media to say, OK, well, if there's if you have 10 options as a voter, we only want you to notice these three. And here's what we want you to know about them. And we don't want you to know about the others. And if you look them up, we're going to make sure there's a whole lot of negative stuff, uh, a lot of it which is not even true, so that you won't be even tempted to go, uh, to, to go past or around the people that we want you to know of. And that's exactly why when I questioned Kamala Harris on that debate stage, my shock was 
number one, she was so unprepared. Like she never expected anyone to question her record. But number two, why didn't anyone question her record? Why didn't a reporter at any level say, hey, here, you're saying you want to be the prosecutor president. Here's the record that you're standing on. How do you account for that? Just a simple question like that was never asked. And it's because of what I'm talking about. They already made their decision of who they liked, who they didn't like. And how dare Tulsi Gabbard from Hawaii, you know, raise these issues to Kamala Harris about her record. And the world saw her answers. Well, I love, your, thereof. I love the backbone that the world saw that night in you. And, and, uh, and they kept on excluding you from debates. And you're right. Every single media friendly person at Tulsi Gabbard, suddenly the same exact people were saying almost as if written the same exact lines about who you were and, and why right. you should be ignored and why you were bad and why Putin loved you. And you got you went to his wedding or something. You know, the, the whole thing was just so ridiculous. It's it, uh, very comparable, I think, to Donald Trump. I've interviewed him like 12 times now. And we've got a good relationship. I, but one of the first interviews I ever had with him, I said, what were you thinking? You know, you made all this money for NBC on the, the Apprentice. You're a billionaire that everybody wanted to, your money from. Yet when you ran for president, did you really think they would just love you still? He said, yeah, I did. I thought they were my friends. And, and I, I get the feeling you're a trusting person like I am. I'll trust you until I shouldn't. And I think right. immediately you found out, A, they're not, they're not questioning Kamala Harris. So she's, been, she's gotten the tap. She's going to be somebody big. Uh, nobody was calling out Joe Biden on his uh, obvious uh, cognitive issues and his history as a racist in this country. And, and, and you just watched them go. And you, thought, you really thought it was an even game when you walked in. Kind of like Trump. He, he, he thought, hey, I've got these friends for 30 years. Why would they turn on me? And every single one did. Is that a good comparison yeah. or no? I think that's very fair. Uh, you know, they, they show their true colors uh, through these political campaigns. And I think this is where, you know, the, this culture of fear is, has gotten so bad because they perpetuate this response that if you dare to step outside the lines, if you dare to challenge their power, which I think is, is the thing in common, right? They saw yes. Trump as a threat. Uh, they saw me as a threat. And so the, their way of dealing with that, rather than doing it in the American way, where you have a debate in our open marketplace of ideas and let our ideas, let voters be exposed to their ideas and, and make the decision based on that comparison. They don't want to allow any of that to happen. And so they resort immediately to smear tactics, character assassination, spreading lies, and uh, and, and trying to to plant that seed of doubt so that whatever whatever you say, uh, people will kind of think for a minute like, oh, I don't really know much about her, right. but there's something. There's something well, it's there. A, well, it's and, a and the sad part is it works. Wait, it's a, it's a feather in your cap because they were scared to death of you. And I think that's a very good thing. You know, a couple of years later, hopefully you see it that way. Um, at, at the end of the day, you really did threaten the machinery of the Democrat Party because you love America and because you wouldn't fit into yeah. a, a box for them. And I think that that's really, really impressive. It's Tulsi Gabbard. Go to TulsiGabbard.com. She's got a new show, The Tulsi Gabbard Show, every Tuesday. Go to the website. Find out where you can go and listen to it. Watch it on YouTube, on Rumble, and, and several other sources. All right, so I've got a really good friend. His name is Nico LaHood. He was the DA here in San Antonio, Texas, in Bear County, Texas. And he was a Democrat lifelong, blue dog Democrat, and he and I are best friends. And, and I'm a conservative through and through. But he was a conservative Democrat, and he was somebody who really did weigh every situation by what was presented. And let's take that, th- these facts, put them together, and see if this person's guilty or innocent or whatever as the DA. He decided to walk away as well. He said the Democrat Party left him a long time ago and left his father and his mother and everybody historically who voted Democrat. And I get the feeling that's exactly what happened to you. Um, but I guess the first question about your announcement the other day has to be, Tulsi, why were you ever a Democrat? What did you think the party was? Well, Joe, when I joined the Democratic Party, it was 2002. I was in Hawaii, 21 years old, not not attached politically or, or right. affiliated. I never really thought about, you know, oh, well, which party am I supposed to be a part of before then? But I was running for state house. And I had to answer that question on the form. I had to fill it out in order to file my election papers. And so I really did start to think about uh, where I felt most at home or most aligned. And what I saw then was, was a party inspired by the vision of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, you know, uh, of, of each of us as Americans being judged based on the content of our character, not the color of our skin. I was inspired by President Kennedy. I was inspired by leaders both in Hawaii and across the country who were committed to fighting for working people, uh, the everyday American who's struggling and dealing with dealing with a whole host of challenges. 
uh, a party that that represented the traditional kind of liberalism, uh, liberalist principles of individual freedom, civil li- civil liberties, a government of, by, and for the people. Right. And that was that was the Big Tent Inclusive Party that I joined. Fast forward twenty years later, and and much more so over the last few years, uh, that party is no longer recognizable. Today's Democrat Party has been taken over and completely controlled by these uh, radical so-called woke ideologues who are essentially they're fanatics that if you don't if you don't agree with them on every issue and that's not even good enough if you're not out there marching and protesting with your bullhorn and screaming and yelling and shouting anything short of that you're not good enough you are not welcome and they will seek to undermine your freedom of speech and cancel and smear you and you know a party that is a party that is undermining our fundamental God-given rights and freedoms enshrined in our Constitution, and doing so because they're in power with the force of law, the Department of Justice, the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, all of these institutions behind them, which they are weaponizing against their political opponents, that is unacceptable. Yeah. And for me, I, I could no longer have that letter D next to my name and be associated with any of that. Yeah, but Tulsi, you know, uh, John F. Kennedy would be a conservative today, at least fiscally. Uh, uh, I mean, Martin Luther King Jr. was a conservative guy. He was a, a, a very religious uh, guy. He's a, he's a reverend. He believed in, in the things that, generally speaking, conservatives believe in. But the Democrat Party can claim them, and they've attempted to claim them, yet they made this sea change. How did the radical far left nutsos take this party over? Well, why allow that? How did it happen? Do you know? You know, I, I can't speak to kind of the history and progression. All I know is that uh, they've created such a culture of fear that people within the Democrat Party yeah. who are very uncomfortable with the policies and the actions that uh, those in charge are moving forward and and not only proposing to Congress, but they're they are taking the approach of trying to backdoor these changes through the administration, through rule changes and regulation changes, and forcing compliance rather than taking it to Congress in the form of a bill so that the American people can have a say through the voices of their representatives. They created this culture of fear that people see how I'm treated and how I, how I have been treated yes. for years by leaders in the Democrat Party, and they think, like, my gosh, I don't want to go through that. I don't know that I can withstand those attacks. I might lose my job or I might lose my reputation or I might lose loved ones, family members and friends. And they make their decision accordingly to just either, either, you know, sit down and get along, go along and just take it uh, or, you know, uh, turn a blind eye, put their head in the sand and pretend like we're not seeing the kind of destruction to the fabric of our country that is that is happening under those in power right now, the Democrat Party in power. You went from uh, winning that debate, the first debate, easily. And I'm a conservative guy. I watched and you won um, uh, to where they put you on the shelf. They had to. Um, you went from that to campaigning for people like Kerry Lake, who's as conservative yeah. as I am. That's quite a leap. Um, have you always agreed with me? This is what I say about Americans, and I wonder if you agree with this. I think we agree on 75 to 85% of everything, and then we disagree on 15 to 20% of stuff, and then we can have that debate and have that argument. Do you and I agree on a lot of stuff? Again, I'm a through and through conservative guy, and Carrie Lake and I don't disagree on much. Um, are you somebody who believes in, in that conservative American, true, historic, uh, traditional value system, or are you backing her because she's the right person at the right time? Uh, well, let me start by saying, uh, you know, these labels of progressive and conservative mean different things to different people at different okay. times, which is generally why I try to stay away from them. Here's why it's not a leap. And I actually talked about this at the rally that I had with Carrie uh, the other night. I think that was last night. I'm losing track of time. I saw the picture, of you. I saw the picture of you and Sheriff ago. Mark Lamb, too. He's a great guy. Yeah, I, and well, awesome. I, I, the fact I that you were there you. blew my mind. But go ahead. Continue. Here's what I talked about uh, with Carrie at that rally in Phoenix was that some people say, hey, this is a this is like a shock. This is a leap. How is this happening? What do you have in common? It's not a leap when we recognize what you just talked about, that we have more in common than we realize. And the most important things that we value and that we have in common is a deep love and appreciation for our country, our constitution, uh, our Bill of Rights and our freedom. That has to be the foundation and the connection that we share because going on from there, that, that's what allows us to really talk through a lot of the other issues. Maybe some we end up agreeing on, some we disagree on. Right. But if we can stand together as fellow Americans and say, you know, 
the goal of leaders in this country, whether they're at the national level, at the state level, or the local level, must be to ensure peace, prosperity, security, and freedom for the American people. And we need to make decisions and implement policies that will work towards that goal, will work towards the best interests of the American people, not a special interest, not a political party, but actually for the well-being of the people. Leaders like Kerry have the courage to stand up to those external pressures who are looking out for their own selfish interests and actually fight for the well-being of the people. And that's why I went and uh, endorsed her and uh, was glad to stand next to her on that stage. But what's interesting is what you just said used to be just a given. Uh, we love the flag. Exactly. We love the anthem. We love the country. USA, USA, USA. We love free speech. We love the fact that the Constitution protects us from the government overrunning us. And that's suddenly gone out the window. There is a faction in this country, a, a, a growing percentage, unfortunately, because they're getting to the young people, who believe that we are just fundamentally a bad country. And we've got to get rid of the flag and the anthem. And you can't say USA because that's racist. Um, what do you say to them? How do you get through to them? And again, your demeanor probably is better than mine because I'm just going to get frustrated <laughs> and pull my hair out. But but uh, well, Joe, how do you get through to them? Do, do you? Can you? You know, I, I think... Um I think the things that you're saying, those who haven't had firsthand experience might think like, of course, of course, we love the flag. Of course, we love Independence Day. Of course, we love America. This is the norm. This is America. We've right. always expressed great pride in this country. But as you're saying, um, there, again, it is the, it's this crazy, insane, so-called woke leaders who don't love our country who don't appreciate or love our Constitution. In fact, they see the Constitution, our freedom of speech, our freedom of thought, uh, a free and open marketplace of ideas as a threat to their power. And so what you're talking about is being implemented uh, at, at the ground level. I'm here in the Quad Cities in Illinois. I'm supporting a woman named Esther Joy King, who's running for Congress. Right. And I was at an event with her last night uh, in Freeport, Illinois, a uh, working class community generally has trended towards Democrats, but there's a lot of frustration there with the Democrat Party. I spoke to a teacher who came to this event. I expressed my appreciation for her in being a teacher, and she was telling me about her experiences. She's an art teacher, and she has gotten reprimanded by her leadership, which is coming from policy set at the state level here in Illinois, for uh, encouraging kids or teaching kids, giving them the opportunity to do patriotic art. Wow. New art that has something to do with the flag, that has something to do with freedom, that has something to do with uh, the principles, the founding principles of this country. She has been told by her leadership, reprimanded as a teacher, you better stop or else you will lose your job. She That's got nuts. really emotional about this. And she's been a teacher for over 25 years. And it, it is absolutely insane. And now she is having to make the decision. And she is, you know, God bless her and her courage. She's continuing to do it, even though Good. she knows that she may get fired. But, you know, it's not lost on you nor me that these people that are that are putting these rules in place are utilizing their freedoms to do so. They're That's free right. to say they hate the country. They're free to say that I'm going to kneel, you know, when the flag is uh, is is being flown and the national anthem is on because it's all racist. They can do that because here, go to North Korea and do that. Go to China and do exactly. that. Go to Venezuela and do that. They can't. So, so, Tulsi, they know what they're doing. They know why they're doing it. It's a hope to indoctrinate yeah. the young people. So let me ask you this, and I wonder if you've given this any thought. Why do they do it? What, what is their hope? That they'll become a monarch and the boss of me? What, what is their, their end game isn't to give it back to the Native Americans. So what is the end game, do you think? Their end game is their own power for their own selfish interest. And in their mind, they believe that, uh, you know, the end justifies the means. Wow. I think a lot of them believe that they are really the best thing for this country, that they believe they are the only ones who can, quote unquote, help the people and save our country and save our democracy. But they are ruining our democracy, threatening and undermining our freedoms and hurting the American people now in the short term, as well as for our kids and grandkids who will come later. And in their minds, as long as they're the ones in power, because they know what's better for us than anyone else. They will do whatever, whatever it takes to hold on to that power and to get more. Yeah, you've given me more time than expected, and I just have another question or two. Thank you for the time, and please come on my show anytime. My listeners and my viewers have been dying to see you and, and hear you, and thank you for doing it. Um, I've got to ask you about, about the midterm, and, and in this sense, if the Republicans don't get back the House and the Senate, is there any stopping 
the endless war in Ukraine and our funding of it? Is there any stopping um, this far move to the radical left where the, the chief executive gets to decide what laws are followed and which ones aren't? Is there any stopping the porous border and the decimation of these border towns here in Texas? If the Republicans don't get back this power to keep him in check, are we in as much trouble as I think? Yes, very simply, yes. Uh, it's I, I'm working 14 hours a day, traveling from one state to the other every day until election day because we are in as much trouble as you think. It was 66 Republicans in the House and Senate combined who voted against this $40 billion escalation bill uh, for this proxy war against Russia with the Biden administration and NATO using the Ukrainian people in Ukraine as their proxies, a clear escalation that has only continued to push us to the brink of nuclear war that threatens all of us and our future and the possibility of, a war, of, of the world as we know it still existing. 66 Republicans voted against it. Not enough, but a statement in and of itself. Not a single Democrat voted against that bill. Not a single Democrat has voted in, against any of the subsequent funding bills, sending tens of billions more dollars uh, to Ukraine since. Uh, you know, not a single Democrat is standing up that I'm aware of uh, saying we need to close the borders. Kamala Harris is saying we have secure borders. Meanwhile, there are millions, millions of people who are continuing to cross the border yep. illegally. Uh, we have, uh, you know, problems within our education system. Parents' voices are not being heard. Inflation continues to rise. Gas prices are going up in so many places. The value of the dollar that working people across this country our earning is continuing to be worth less and less, making it more difficult for them to be able to feed their kids and pay their heating bills, especially in a lot of these states are, are heading into the winter. There's a lot of problems here. Unless we, unless we all get out and do our part in these midterm elections and, bring, and change the balance of power so that Congress is not just a rubber stamp, uh, you know, back-scratching element for, for the Biden administration's policies and vice versa, We've got to have the check and balance in power, which is why it's so important, so important to get out and cast your vote and bring some other people along with you. She's out there on the stump campaigning for great candidates across the country. It's Tulsi Gabbard. Go to TulsiGabbard.com. Go and check out her new program, The, T the Tulsi Gabbard Show. I can't wait to start listening to it. I want to I want to end with this, and, and thank you so much again for the time that you've given me. I'm going to make two nice segments out of this over two days. Sounds good. When it comes to what you said earlier about big tech, big media, I can add in big academia, big Hollywood, big music, big sports. They're all in collusion to try to convince us that what's not true is true and what's true is not true. We know that there are studies that show 10% to 14% of Democrats that voted for Biden would not have had they known anything about Hunter Biden's laptop, which was squelched. That the, New York, uh, the New York Post was eliminated from Twitter until after the election. And then Jack Dorsey said, ah, made a mistake. Is there any way yeah. to, to, to let those who are watching and listening know that they can find the truth and they, they shouldn't rely on big media? They shouldn't rely on big tech. They shouldn't rely on what they're seeing on their TVs or hearing on the radio necessarily. I mean, Tulsi, I tell people, I've, a, I've got 170 stations and 6 million listeners. And I tell them every day, don't believe me. Go and check out what I just said. And if I was wrong, let me know. And, and thankfully, I've done my homework and I'm generally not wrong. So what can we tell them other than listening to the Joe Pag show, the Tulsi Gabbard show, where they can get real information and trust it? Be, be cynical and skeptical about the information you're hearing from the mainstream media because they have a very clear agenda and it is not telling the truth. And uh, we've lost journalistic integrity in so many places in our mainstream media. The example that you cited is a really important one, Joe, about how uh, you have the media, mainstream media, working with the FBI, working with 50 senior intelligence officials, including a number of former directors of the CIA, right. all working together to say, you know what, if, if the contents of Hunter Biden's laptop are seen by the public in just a couple of weeks before election day, Joe Biden could lose this election. And again, what did I say earlier? The, the end justifies the means. They decided to steal our democracy, withhold that information from voters because they felt that it would make their guy lose, and then go out and create this lie that we think this is Russian disinformation and oh, should be yeah. withheld from the voter. Obviously, it has come to bear that that was not the case. Many of us knew that from the beginning. 
Uh, but there's been no accountability. Not a single one of those individuals that I'm aware of has made any kind of apology or said, you know what, I'm really sorry, we were wrong. Like you said, people should do their research and hold you to account as, and same for me, yeah. if I'm saying things that are wrong and I'll go back and I'll fix it. Not a single one of those 50 senior intelligence officials has apologized and they were asked by a media source, every single one of them, not a single one apologized. So, so the ante is on us, the responsibility is in our hands if you're paying attention to the mainstream media, don't believe every single thing you hear. Ha have a questioning mind. And if you hear something that's a little bit off, go in and dig deeper. Better yet, go to different new media sources like your show, Joe, like others, whether it's on Substack or radio or podcasts, online shows. There's a lot of other places and sources you can go now uh, where people are actually telling the truth, providing information, providing different views and perspectives. Right. Uh, in a way that that should be welcomed in our country, uh, but that the mainstream media, the permanent Washington establishment, that they don't want. I can't thank you enough for the time. Go and follow her on Substack. Uh, go to her website, uh, uh, TulsiGabbard.com. Check out her brand new program. I know you're on Locals as well. Follow her wherever, wherever she happens to be. The, the candidates she's pushing for are, are people who love America and love the Constitution and want freedom and liberty and want to keep this administration in check. It's Tulsi Gabbard. Tulsi, thanks a million thanks, for all Joe. this time, and, and hopefully we can talk again soon. Thank you. Great to talk to you. All right. We're back after this. Stay right here.